Hey everybody, when we kicked off this series, we said we'd be bringing in some great preachers this summer. And today you get to hear from my friend, Jeremy Taylor. Uh, Jeremy is the pastor of Journey Church up in Seattle, Washington. And if you spent any time up in that area, you know this is not the time of year you want to leave the Pacific Northwest. Um, but here he is along with his wife, April, today. Um, I've gotten to know Jeremy through a group of pastors that I've been meeting with from around the country for coaching, uh, training, support, and uh, man, I've been so helped by Jeremy. I'm so encouraged seeing uh, his heart for his church and what they're doing up in Seattle there. Uh, So encouraged to see his heart for Jesus. And um, frankly, he's one of the most quotable people I know. And so note takers, get ready. You're gonna have a great time today. And even if you're not a note taker, get ready to hear a word from God through my friend, Jeremy. Would you welcome him forth? Well, good morning. It is really a joy to be here this morning. And uh, again, my name is Jeremy. My wife, April, is down front here, and we've been enjoying our time. Uh, We flew in Friday and spent a little bit of time in your neck of the woods. Um, And I really appreciate uh, your pastor. I appreciate his kind uh, and generous words towards me. And man, uh, I'm growing to love your pastor and I know that you do as well. Uh, one of the things I love about watching Chad is his passion. He's a passionate man, isn't he? He uh, has passion for God, for his word, and he truly is passionate about you, his church. It's infectious. And uh, whether we're together in person, which uh, we are usually about twice a year or so, or uh, many times we meet virtually, um, he's always bragging about how amazing you are as a church. And uh, truly just being here this weekend has allowed us to see how blessed he is as a pastor to have you as a church, but also uh, I just want to let you know, because I can say this, that, that you are blessed to have him as a pastor. And uh, we're glad that he is out. Let me just check my notes, see if there's anything else he wanted me to say. Um, greatest pastor in the world. He's also very good looking. Um, he wanted me to make sure he'll be watching this and... Um, What Chad and I have been talking about, um, though, in anticipation of today is the journey that you as a church are going through in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and your summer of love. How each week, both individually and as a church body, you've been learning and dreaming about how you could live in a more excellent way. That phrase there, a more excellent way, that's actually verbatim what an ancient pastor and church planner named Paul told his church in a little town called Corinth. He encouraged them to start learning and dreaming about how they could live together in a more excellent way. It's not a good way. It's not a great way. It's not, not a better than this way. It's a more excellent way to live. And that way is the way of love. Now, surprise, surprise, especially in our day of age, right? Every, everybody's talking about love. We love our sports teams. We love our pets. We love our certain foods. I love pizza. Um, we uh, came in Friday night, and we quickly got here, and then um, we had to go into San Francisco Friday night because my favorite pizza place in the entire world is in Little Italy. It's called Tony's Pizza. We discovered it as a family a number of years ago, and, and we really weren't quite sure it was as good as we thought it was. You ever have that? You think it's something's good, and then you retaste it. You're like, I guess it wasn't, but this was. We went in Friday night, and the place was, was hopping, and we had our pizza, and I got to tell you, it still is at the top of our list. I love pizza. I, we, we, there are things that, that we love, and it was great to, to have April because it reminds me that I love my wife, and I had to tell her on Friday, I still love you more than pizza. <laughs> this is good, but you're, you're, you're a more excellent way, sweetie. And you love your spouse. You love your kids. You have those relationships that, that you love. Everybody's talking about love. So, so when Paul's talking about love, we shouldn't be that surprised. But if that's the case, why isn't our world a paradise? If, like the band Wet, Wet, Wet sings, love is all around us, and the Beatles tell us that love is all you need, why is the world still so broken? Why do we feel messy still? You're learning this summer that love truly is a more excellent way. And the more excellent way type of love is different from the love of the world because the love of the world claims to deliver a lot, but ultimately delivers a little. 
Pastor Paul gives us some key descriptions of what love is ordered like and the identity that God's authentic love drives love deeper in his claims in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You've read it many times this summer, but I want to read it again for us this morning. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. Love always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Today we're looking at love always trusts. Trust is a small word with a big impact. Trust like this is never passive. Trust isn't an intellectual exercise that we go through. The first thing I want us to remember together this morning, church, is that trust is belief in action. Trust is belief in action. When we need to define trust, we need to realize that it's belief in action. April and I were in college way back in the ancient world of the 90s together. And uh, while we were at college, the, our, our college hosted a youth kind of conference, and there were about 4,000 students that came in. And uh, not only was the conference large, but our chapel was massive. It could hold 4,000. It was four stories high. And one of the, the conferences that they came in, one of the, the special guests that they brought in for that conference was a tightrope walker um, from the family called the Flying Walendas. And, and so four stories in the air, they put their tightrope across, the, um, across the ceiling just below it and, and uh, ultimately set up there and there was no net underneath. The only thing that would have caught and then stopped their fall if he was to fall from that height was the choir underneath him. Now, something I didn't tell you is April was in the choir, I was not. So the first time Tony Walenda gets up there on the tightrope, he's kind of perched up there right over this, this young woman that I'm starting to fall in love with. And my first thought is if he falls, he, he will schmuck her. And I, I love her. And if she dies, I'm going to have to start all over again. And so I was praying really hard that, that he would stay up there. And, and so he walked a couple times and it was fine. But then there was this one session where he gets up there and he starts at the edge of the platform, not yet onto the tightrope. And he says, hey, let me tell you about trust. He said, trust isn't just belief, it's belief in action. He said, I could stand on this platform and I could look at the wire and I could say that I, I could trust that the wire would hold me. He said, I could look at it and think of all the training that I've done and say that I could believe that my training will get me across the tightrope. But he says, unless I lift up my foot and put it onto the tightrope, my belief is not trust because trust is belief in action. So he, he starts to walk across using this illustration and, and he comes out with, you know, the tightrope walker, right? He's got the big bar and, and on the bar, he's got a chair. And it's kind of just standing like this, it's kind of hanging like this on the, on the bar. And he gets about uh, halfway out, right over my uh, lovely April girlfriend. And, and, and he says, you know what? I could believe that this chair would hold me. And I could believe that I have the ability to sit on this chair, on this tightrope. But unless I do it, then I'm just believing, I'm not trusting. Because trust is belief in action. So he takes the chair and he undoes it and he puts it behind him on the tightrope and he begins to sit down. He shows us that trust is belief in action. And then this crazy person does this. He's on this tightrope, right? I'm not, luckily I'm not. And and then he starts doing this. And he starts to sit down. And you're not wondering if I'm going to make it, and I'm on a stage. I know some of you right now are just tensing up. Is he going to fall? This will be the greatest sermon ever. And he starts to talk, and he lays the bar across here, and he starts to talk about Jesus and how ultimately to trust Jesus is to put our belief in Jesus into action. I'm not going to preach like this. I'm not trusting myself for the whole thing. Trust is belief in action. And when we talk about love always trusts, 
We are told to be a people of action. This isn't lovey, dovey, weak sauce kind of love. This is action hero level trust. Trust is belief in action. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Your trust, you trust in God, trust also in me. He is calling them to action-oriented belief because in just a couple days from those moments where he is speaking to them, all will seem lost. In a couple days from that moment where he told them to trust in him, it will look like the movement that he has started is done because of his death. In just a couple days from that moment, he will have died. It will look like the wire gave way, that the chair did not hold, and that he was dead. They couldn't even imagine in those moments a more excellent way. They couldn't even imagine that that was about to emerge. What does action of trust look like? I'd like to spend some of our time there. I'd like to put concrete thoughts together for that this morning. Did you know that you, by nature, are distrusting? And not just because you're special, you're like me, because all of humanity has this default to distrust first. Psychologists would call it the fundamental attribution error. That just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Fundamental attribution error. And and basically what the fundamental attribution error is, is it says that when we perceive bad behavior in other people, what we do is we attribute it to bad character. But when we see that same bad behavior in ourselves, we do not attribute it to bad character. We attribute it to the situation that we find ourselves in. An easier way of putting it is that we cut ourselves some slack in the same situations where we would harshly judge someone else. There's always a gap. And the gap is this, we observe something, a fact, something happens, we see it, and then there's the truth of why it actually happened. And from the observation to the truth, there is a gap. And the fundamental attribution error says that when that gap is with someone else's behavior, I will always fill that gap with something like, that's a bad character, that's a bad person, they're a bad blank. But when I see the gap, I cut myself some slack. Let let me give you an example of this. I'm sure you don't have bad drivers down here, but we definitely do in the Seattle area. So when I get cut off abruptly by one of those bad drivers, he just kind of veers in and cuts me off on the highway. My first instinct, because of the fundamental attribution error, is to say, that is a terrible person. I cannot believe that they even gave that person a license. Right? I've observed the fact that they cut me off. I don't know why they did it. All I know is that there's a gap and that person is terrible. And they're, they're bad character. They're probably from California. <laughs> One of the reasons you probably don't have bad drivers is because you sent them all to us. Thank you for that. Now, when I cut somebody off, which doesn't happen very often, but, but if I cut someone off, I'm not a bad driver. I'm not a person of bad character. I'm not a terrible person. No, I've got my wife in the car and she's going into labor and I need to get to the hospital. True story, it happened. Do you see the difference here? The gap gets filled, but the choice that we have is how we fill the gap. And I'm pretty sure that Paul didn't know about the fundamental attribution error, but what I do know is that Paul knew people and he knew their natures. And when he wants to describe a more excellent way through love, he tells us that love always trusts. Love always looks at the person in front of us, no matter who they are, and chooses to be a person of action who fills the gap in a way that leads to the flourishing of whatever the relationship is in front of us. See, the gap between what we observe and what was actually true, it will always be filled The choice isn't to fill it or not. The choice is, are we going to be people of trust? Are we going to put our beliefs into action that fills the gap in a different way? When the person across from us, again, whoever they are, will we fill the gap with suspicion or confidence, with conjecture or truth? 
with fear or faith, with anger or calm? Will we fill that gap with manipulation or sacrifice, explosion or conversation, with accusation or with grace? And I want you this morning, church, to be uh, an active participant in our discussion together. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think of that moment, that experience that you had with someone. It could be a spouse. It could be a parent, a child, a friend, a coworker, where they did something. You observed something, and you didn't specifically in that moment know the truth of why that something happened, and you filled the gap, and, and you didn't do it well. I want you to think of that moment as probably a conversation that kind of turned sideways all of a sudden. It was probably something that took a little time to restore or recover from. It probably included an apology of some point at the end. But I I want you to think and crystallize that moment in your mind. I want that today to be kind of your case study as we look at a more excellent way to love through trusting. To being people with belief that put belief into action as we fill the gap. Do you have it? That situation, your case study for this morning. Because the first way that we want to fill the gap is we want to fill the gap with truth. Our ability to fill the gap poorly can cause us to react defensively, even with those closest to us. And we do this because we're just kind of reactive beings. To fill the gap with truth helps me look at the person in front of me for who they really are. In our home, uh, we use language like we are on your team, that we are Team Taylor, that we want the best for you. And we have uh, two teenage daughters, an 18-year-old and a soon-to-be 15-year-old, and then we have a little, we have a man child who's not so little anymore, and he just turned 12. And so you could you could appreciate the fact that there are things that we as parents do that that don't really don't really engender our kids to say, oh, you're the best parents ever, right? Like we put boundaries. We say, hey, some social media sites you're not gonna go on and and we create kind of the the guardrails in their lives. And I gotta tell you, in our family at least, maybe it's not true for you, but for us it is, that that we're not always filling the gap great (laughs) in our family. And so we've created this language like, hey, we're on your team. Because we want to fill the gap with truth. That listen, you may think that I'm the enemy right now. You may think that because I told you you're not staying out till one o'clock in the morning, I, I want, you know, I want the worst for you. But listen, that's not the truth. The truth is I want what's best for you, and you just don't see it right now. And so you need to fill the gap. And we use this language in our family: fill the gap, fill it with trust, with truth, because we trust, we put our belief in action that 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 person in front of me, they're, they're truly on my team. They truly want what's best for me. And if you're talking to someone who you may not have that deep relationship with, it just may be a stranger, it may just be that person who cuts you off, there is still a fundamental truth that you can fill the gap with, is that person in front of you is an image bearer of the Almighty God. That that, that person in front of you will always look like God and bear his image that God loves them that so much that he sent his only son so that that person may come to life and life abundantly when we fill the gap with truth we are intentionally setting aside our judgment our negative thoughts our selfishness that may creep in and we are choosing to seek the best for that person we are looking past the observed facts And we're looking over the situation and we're looking into the eyes, into the heart, into the soul of another human being who's created in God's image. And we choose to fill the gap with truth. I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about your case study that you crystallized just a couple seconds ago. What would filling the gap with truth helped in that situation? How would taking the opportunity to seek the truth to stop kind of just the quick reaction, but, but ask yourself, is this person really for me? Do they really love me? Where, what, what is this relationship worth to me? To see the person in front of you as they truly are, see them through the lens and the eyes that God would see them through. Would you lean into the relationship and have them and move forward with truth, not just reaction when you fill the gap with truth? 
One of the ways to trust, to put our belief into action is to fill the gap with truth. The next one is to fill the gap with listening. The best tool we have for listening is to ask questions. If we start to be expert question askers, then we will fill the gap with trust more than distrust. Like Walt Whitman and Ted Lasso have told us, we need to be curious, not judgmental. When we ask questions, then we have the opportunity to ask the question and then to, to, to quietly listen, to be active listeners. And by doing this, we intentionally fill the gap differently than the way we are pre-programmed to do so. The writer of Proverbs says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. James, Jesus' own brother, says, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Listening quickly means trusting that the person across from us is telling us and telling us the truth. With their words, with their tone, with their body language, with the investment of the relationship that has been there, we can trust what we hear and what we see in that person and their answer. Again, the writer of Proverbs tells us, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ears of the wise seek knowledge. Now, it may seem if we're asking a lot of questions that we become inquisitors and it's okay to become an inquisitor. What we don't want to become is interrogators. We're asking questions and the first person that we should be asking a question of is ourselves. What are the facts? What did I see here? What conclusions might I be leaping to? What does their body language tell me? What do I know to be true of this relationship? How could I miss, be misreading this situation? The first and foremost person that we should be asking questions to is ourselves. We need to start with the heart. Start with our heart. And then we can ask questions of the person or the persons in front of us. Let me give you an example of this. And uh, let's just say this happened, maybe. Um, I get home from work one night, and, and my wife meets me right at the door, and, and April says, hey, I need you to go clean the garage now. You said you'd do it last night, and it didn't get done. Please go clean it now. Now there's a gap. I'm getting home from work. She doesn't know the situation. She doesn't know it was a hard day at work. She just knows that she needs the garage done. She doesn't know that I was up last night doing a project and it just kind of got bigger than I thought it would and I got to bed later than I thought I would and I just said, oh, I'll deal with it later. And, and, and she doesn't know that at work that day, I, was, I just had a terrible day. I had some people just, you know, just great on me and it was just a hard day. And the first thing I get when I get home is, you need to go do this. And so I observe that she wants this done now. And the truth of the situation is I don't know what the reason for that is. She's left it all day. It's been there all day. I'm not sure what that is. And, and I can choose to fill the gap. And, and what I probably did, most likely, is I filled the gap in a wrong way. I, I thought, what, does she think I'm lazy? What, does she think I didn't just, you know, do all this work last night and just wanted to leave it there? What, does she think that I think so little of her that, that I would just expect her to clean it up? Why, why would she do this? And I could become defensive unless I fill the gap with listening. And so I asked the question, first of myself, what, who is this woman in front of me? It's my wife. I love her. God saved her from a flying Walenda. And, and so he meant us to be together. She, she wants the best for me. She's on my team. She wouldn't accuse me of that. She knows I'm not lazy. So I ask a question of her. Sweetie pie? Because, you know, that's how we talk when we're really angry in my house. We're perfect people in the Northwest. Sweetie pie? Why would I have to do that now? And she would say something like, well, you know what? I just got a call from our neighbor. They need to drop off the kids. There's an emergency in their house and, and we're going to take the kids. But, you know, that's kind of a play area in the, in the garage. So if you could clean that up, then we have a place to take care of these kids that are unexpectedly coming to our house. And all goes back to love in the Taylor house. Now, it doesn't always go that way. But when I fill the gap with, with listening, when I ask a question first, both of myself and then the person in front of me, then that is a more excellent way to love. Because love always trusts, and trust is belief in action. And so I wonder for you, taking a moment thinking through uh, how filling the gap with listening would have helped your case study this morning. 
How would that have situation helped you to ask a question both of yourself and the person in front of you, maybe slow down the reel just a moment to, to give the space to be a listener instead of a reactionary? How would taking the opportunity to ask questions fill the gap of inquiring minds want to know? How do we live a more excellent way of love? Well, love always trusts and trust fills the gap with truth, fills the gap with listening, and finally fills the gap with love. Jesus' disciple named Peter wrote this. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. We just have to look back at the attributes that Paul has been saying to the, first, to the Corinthian church in 13. You've been going through these systematically all summer. That love is patient, love is kind, love protects, love hopes, love perseveres. Can you imagine those words filling the gap? And how that would be a most excellent way. When we fill the gap with love, we look to fill it not just with trust, but with kindness, with patience, with protection, with hope with perseverance. Chad has had you imagining and dreaming what your relationships, what your church, what your community could look like if this was not just a summer of love, but if this was an identity that Fair Oaks Church and the Fair Oaks Church people lived out in the world that they engaged with. To fill the gap with love is to remember that trust is belief in action. But the belief isn't in ourselves. That's what the world says. Just believe in yourself. Just dig a little deeper in yourself. Just try a little bit harder in yourself. The belief that we're looking for isn't in here. It's in Jesus. It's trusting, putting our belief into action that Jesus is a Savior and our Lord. That Jesus not only makes this kind of love possible, but that he's modeled it for us. There's an ancient biographer, his name is Luke, and he tells us about Jesus, and, and one of the stories he has of Jesus is walking through a town of Jericho, and he's kind of getting through the end, and all of a sudden, Jesus looks up as he is exiting the city, and he sees the, the town villain in a tree kind of watching him. And we know that the villain's name is Zacchaeus. We know Zacchaeus is a villain because we're told a couple things by Luke. Luke tells us that he is a chief tax collector, that he is very rich because of his practice. And we know in that time that being a tax collector means that he has built and milked his, uh, his very people for profit on behalf of the oppressors who were the Romans at the time. People would talk about people being tax collectors as a derogatory slur. And Jesus is walking through town and he sees him in the tree. And the reason he's in the tree is because we're told that he is a very short man. You might wonder how short he is. Well, he is always the last to know that it's raining. He's just a very short man. And he is overcompensated possibly for this shortness by raising himself to a stature where everybody hates him. And he has created a wealth on the backs of oppression. And Jesus sees him in this tree. And Jesus could have filled the gap one way. He could have told himself, look, look, look at that guy. That's the enemy of my people. He is a selfish sinner. Here is the man who profits himself deceitfully through financial gain. Jesus could have chosen to, to make a, uh, an example of him so that the crowds in Jericho would have endeared themselves to Jesus by piling on Zacchaeus. But does he do that? No. Were those things true? Yes. But what does Jesus choose? Jesus chooses to show us that there is a love that always trusts. And he fills the gap in a different way. See, Jesus fills the gap with truth. Jesus saw that Zacchaeus was willing to subject himself to a little bit of public scorn. See, men in that day didn't climb trees. Boys did, but men didn't. But, but Zacchaeus did, that he, he was a man who was lost and searching a more excellent way and finding it in less than excellent ways. Jesus saw him and filled the gap with truth. He said that this definitely is a sheep without a shepherd. And so he calls to him. And he brings him into a conversation. He says, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus fills the gap with truth. He fills the gap with listening. Here's what I know about Jesus. He is the master question asker. 
If we look at all the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus uh, in the New Testament, we see there, there's actually a three to one ratio of questions that Jesus asks versus the ones that he actually answers or the statements he makes. Jesus is the master question asker. And so we're not told how the conversation went in Zacchaeus' home. I, I can assume with a high probability that he is asking questions, that he is sitting there eating kosher food with Zach, and he's asking him questions, un, revealing and unpacking Zach's motivations and his life story and how he thinks. Jesus' ability to listen helps Zacchaeus begin to open up start to feel like, oh, he, he belongs in the midst of this righteous rabbi and in relationship with him. And it will ultimately lead to Zacchaeus' life-changing experience. Jesus chooses to fill the gap with truth and to fill the gap with listening and ultimately to fill the gap with love. Jesus' de default setting is love. He tells his disciples earlier, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And Jesus filled the gap so well in those short moments that he had with Zacchaeus and so completely that it changed his life. Jesus would proclaim over this man in his house that today salvation has come to this house since he is also the son of Abraham. And today, Jesus can do the same for you. Jesus filled the greatest gap in history and he did so with himself. Earlier today, we talked about the disciples losing trust because it just seemed like it was over. Jesus was dead, that, that there was a, a finite ending here, and they were beginning to, to think maybe we should just go back to the lives before Jesus. And, and yet, we know by sitting on this side of history that what looked like what an ending was just the beginning. That the gap that ultimately has shown up in our world between a broken and messy, the, the Bible would call it sinful people, and a holy God who always does the right thing the right way at the right time for the right reasons, that that, that gap is insurmountable for us. That we try to fill this gap. We try to do it with religion. We try to do it with, with doing more good than bad, with, with going inside of ourselves and trying to find the true us or, or, or just making sure that we're doing the right thing sometimes the right way, maybe often not always the right timing. And this gap will, will, will never be filled. And yet, on that historic day, Jesus conquered the grave, rose from the dead, and he filled that gap. He did it with himself. Jesus filled the gap with truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus fills that gap with listening. He said, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. Jesus filled the gap with love. He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friend. Folks, I, I don't have the opportunity and have not been in your midst long enough to know you very well. I don't know what situations have brought you to, to this space and to this moment this morning. But here's what I know to be true. That Jesus can fill any hole in your life that you are choosing to fill with other things. That you are choosing to fill with people or actions that ultimately will leave you feeling empty and will not fill that hole. Jesus can restore the hurts and the wounds that have you stuck. Jesus can give you the strength to trust the people in your life, to put your beliefs into action, to help you fill the gap with truth, listening and love day after day to the people around you. I don't know where you're coming from, but I know that you've landed here. And I know you're not here because of coincidence. I like to say that coincidence is just God remaining silent. That you're here today for a reason. And it may be to hear and to, to engage in some of the wonderful music and to have music lift your soul and remind you that there is something that is bigger than yourself to be able to worship. It may be here today to hear these very words that Jesus loves you. That he's on team you. 
that he has already filled the gap and he will continue to fill it and he will continue to give you the strength to fill it in the relationships that are messy and, and broken or, or you're working on in your lives. You're here today because not my words, but his word says that you're worth it because he filled the gap first. In our church, we talk about taking that first step of belief Again, believing and trusting that belief, trust is belief in action. We say it this way, that we trust. That we trust that Jesus is the Savior he said he is. That he is the Lord worthy of allegiance. And that his best is what's best for us. I wonder if you have been trusting that way this week. That you have put your beliefs into action this week. And that that belief has a face in his and a name, and his name is Jesus. Not just a summer of love, Fair Oaks Church, but, but a lifestyle, a more excellent way, as Jesus is that more excellent way. And in him, our love will always trust. It will always fill the gap with truth, listening, and love, because that's who he is. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity today. I thank you that, that your church, your body is here gathered. That we are not just here, but, but that your body is also gathered around this world. And uh, Father, I thank you for these brothers and sisters who we get to meet today, just very quickly and just momentarily. But, but Lord, this is family here this morning. I thank you for Chad and for his family and, that, and echo the prayer of Phil that they would be restored during their time away. Lord, I ask as we have heard today that you would filter, Lord, my words through your spirit, that any attempts, Father, that I have had today would, would be emboldened by your spirit, that, that anything that I said that was not of you would just be put to the side, but that you Lord, would root in us the truth. That you would remind us that we have the opportunity to trust because we have been loved by you. Lord, give us eyes to see this week, opportunities to fill the gaps before us. They will occur, they will happen, they will be there. And I ask that we would be able to see them wisely and to fill them, to fill them Lord, with truth and have it be your truth. Listening and so may we have ears to hear first and love and a love that is a more excellent way as you have modeled it for us. We pray these things in the name of the risen Lord Jesus.